broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Talbot, and I am welcoming everyone to the Department of Family and Support Services, My Shy, My Future, or MCMF, Community Anchor Organizations RFP webinar. In this webinar, we will do such exciting things. We will talk about this webinar and what a great opportunity it is for organizations who might wish to be willing to apply. And then also what a great opportunity it is for the students of the city of Chicago. Um, and we will be joined by my fearless coworkers, Maria Guzman Rocha, who is the manager of family support programs and Tess Landon, who is a project manager here, and they know everything there is to know about this program. So first, a little housekeeping. Do the volume of participants. Everybody is placed on mute. If you have a question, please submit it in the question box, and we will respond to questions at the midpoint and end of the presentations. Uh, I see somebody has already put a question in there. I love that they are beating us all to the punch, but we're gonna go through the whole program a lot of the questions hopefully will be answered by then. Um, if you're having a technical issue, please use the question box to notify us of that and we will try to resolve the issues. Just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be placed on the DFSS YouTube channel with a link to the recording and a PDF of these very PowerPoint slides. Will, they will be posted at the DFSS website, which I gave the the uh, address to basically it's the city of Chicago and then just go to DFSS and the the uh, this will be posted under the alerts or funding opportunities tab. Please mind me uh, mind though that it will take about five business days for us to post this link. Um, inevitably with these webinars somebody always is people always want to know when it's going to be posted. We have to actually process the um, webinar itself and it takes us it just takes a couple of days for us to get it posted to our website so i appreciate in advance i appreciate your patience uh, moving right along here is our agenda so we've already gone through our welcomes and introduction and now i'm going to be turning our presentation over to maria and tess who will explain the rfp the program itself and um, thank you all for coming thank you julia um Good afternoon, everyone. As Julia said, my name is Maria Guzman Rocha. I'm the director of the enrichment portfolio here at DFSS. Um, for, for those of you that I know, um, glad to see all of your names in the um, in the attendee box. And for those of you who are new to our uh, department or who have not attended any of our RFP webinars before, welcome. Um, Happy New Year to everybody. We're still in that phase where we can still say that. So glad to see everyone. Um, and I'm really happy to see the interest that has come with this anchor organization initiative that we're launching this year uh, through the Department of Family and Support Services. Um, before I kick off, we're going to be really thorough. Tess and I are going to be really thorough about the program requirements of the RFP, what things we're looking for in the applications and things like that. But I really advise every single one of you who plans on applying or has already started an application to read the RFP front to back. Um, I know it's a lot of dense information. There's a lot of information in there that it may relate to non-programmatic things, but in terms of the programmatic aspects, we put a lot of work into trying to be as detailed as possible on what this program entails and what we expect to see in applications. So just wanna emphasize that RFP is there as a resource for you. We will answer all questions that come our way, obviously, and help interpret what some of the um, language is, but there is a lot of content in those RF in that RFP to ensure that everyone understands that we're looking at um, all applications in the same way. Um, so just to kick us off in terms of the purpose of the RFP, we are looking to fund 15 agencies um for to run 15 regions across the city addressing the COVID-19 pandemic related effects on young people and communities. This initiative is our ARP funded, so we really want to ensure that we are addressing some of the needs that have come through in these communities. Um, we are seeking to fund organizations with experience in community level convening, strategic planning, and youth development. 
Um, for those of you who have completed Safe Spaces applications or Safe Spaces, the Safe Spaces RFP, this is a little bit different. So I'm going to go into that in the next slide. So as you can see here, we have information about program dis description, the program description and the goals. So we are, we want to fund agencies to convene community level stakeholders and caring adults committed to youth development so that we can mobilize and connect young people of all ages to meaningful out of school time opportunities. All in all, that is the vision and mission of the My Shine My Future initiative, which we'll go into a little bit later. Um, but the work, the actual work, the on the ground work that agencies in this community anchor organization initiative will be doing is hosting monthly convenings of partners to strategize, collaborate and share resources creating and implementing a community plan outlining how agencies in that region that they're applying for including the anchor org are going to support a healthy community ecosystem for youth which research has shown is very beneficial to ensure that everyone is on the same page on what the youth needs are and where it is that agencies can leverage some of that um, and hosting community engagement events which can look very different but for example you know opportunity fairs or trainings across the board um, I talked about the My Shine My Future uh, vision statement. Um, you can see that here. I'm going to really read it really quickly because I know this is something that's very important to all of us and we want to ensure that the why, the bigger picture of what it is that we're doing, um, that we're all on the same page about. So every young person in Chicago connects to a variety of rich, engaging, safe, and youth-centered out-of-school time experiences that empower them to discover and cultivate their talents, passions, skills, and identities, develop as physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy members of society, build relationships and networks with peers and mentors, and explore multiple pathways to college, careers, trades, entrepreneurship, and lifelong learning. Access and participation in Chicago's diverse out-of-school time, out-of-school opportunity ecosystem must be equitable, not equal, across race, gender identities, disability, age, immigration status, income, neighborhood, and other identities, resulting in all young people, as well as their families, mentors, and caring adults, leveraging community assets and the city's resources to build positive futures for themselves and their communities. As an entire initiative, um, this is really important for us to keep our eye on to ensure that this is one stream of work, the My Shine My Future Anchor Community Anchor Organization Initiative, but that all in all, this is what our, our star, our North Star is. So with that, it's really important to highlight because some of you may be really involved with um, the My Shine My Future um, team at the mayor's office, for example, or, you know, have it have uh, have participated in the My Shine My Future kickback series, things like that. There are two different strategies by which we're trying to carry out the vision of My Shine My Future. And we have the citywide strategy, and that is really launched from the citywide, a citywide convening in the fall of 2019. That is the myshinemyfuture.org database of youth programs across the city. That's the, the mobile app, the work that is done at the first Friday meetings. That citywide strategy really gets a high level sense of what the needs and resources that are um, that are available to agencies across the city that is that vision the, or that strategy the community strategy what we call the community strategy it uh, kicked off with the four initial communities of focus back in 2020 um, it grew to a fifth one in the south shore in 2021 and this is where you'll see all of the work for halloween make 2021 yours the kickback series all of that work was in play in that initial stage that has now transitioned over to the strategy or the RFPs that we're talking about now, including the Anchor Org strategy or the Anchor Org RFP. Um, and that has now moved to the Department of Family and Support Services as you're all now sitting in this webinar to really figure out how we can take these events, these agencies, these community strategy regions and really address what some of the needs are through the or as an effect or as a as a cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. So 
this is the three initiatives that I was talking about, or the three RFPs that I was talking about, the Safe Spaces for Youth initiative, and some of you uh, are familiar with that and have submitted an application for that. Um, that was released in the fall of 2022, and that is very similar to the Kickback series that some of you all may be familiar with. That provided year-round programming for youth and families, uh, or that will provide year-round programming for youth and families and employment opportunities for youth ages 16 to 24 in 15 regions. They are the same 15 regions that we're going to talk about here in this um, in this RFP as well. The regions are aligned, so don't want to confuse anyone. Um, the microgrant program, we are expecting a release in 2023, and that's going to provide funding for youth programs um, for a small funding amounts for youth programs within these 15 regions, and that'll probably come out in the next few um, weeks. And then the focus of this RFP or this webinar is the Community Anchor Organization Initiative, which we can get into now. So I, with that, I will pass it over to Tess to talk a little bit more about the RFP in general and the program requirements. Thank you, Maria. Hi, everyone. My name is Tess Land, and I'm the program manager for project manager for um, I Shy for My Future and Enrichment at DFSS. Um, just before I get into it, echo Maria's excitement uh, about this program and about all of you being here and your interest in the program. So, um, as Maria mentioned, the goal of this program is to select an agency in each of the 15 My Shy My Future strategy regions, which we'll go through. Um, to convene youth serving agencies and individuals towards the goal of developing a community plan focused on youth engagement opportunities. Um, with this RFP, as well as with all of the work that DFSS does, we are really committed to building on best practices in youth development. Um, and the way that we do that is through focusing on a number of priorities that are research based. Um, so those are listed here strengthening community based approaches to addressing. COVID-19 pandemic related harms on youth and their communities, strengthening collaborative community partnerships, fostering positive youth development through accessible and equitable approaches, a strengths based approach to working with youth and centering youth voice, and prioritizing continuous um, improvement. So focusing on using data to make decisions. And you'll sort of see how each of these priorities come through in the elements of the program and the requirements. So if you have um, looked at the RFP or applied to the other My Shy My Future safe spaces, you'll be familiar with the 15 My Shy My Future community strategy regions. So these are regions across the city that um, cover 19 city of Chicago community areas. And each of these community areas was identified because they rank highly on the Chicago COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index and or the UIC Chicago Community Area Economic Hardship Index. Um, additionally, a number of these community strategy regions are the focus of mayoral initiatives like the Community Safety Coordination Center um, or Invest Southwest. Uh, to be clear, delegates who will be recommended for funding for this RFP must be based in one of the 19 community areas within the 15 strategy regions. So both the programming um, done through this RFP must engage young people in communities in those areas, but also the agencies must have an address and have their home base be within the community strategy region. So looking at those 15 regions in the left column, you can see these are the names of the 15 regions. And then on the right, you can see the city of Chicago community areas served by those um, regions. So a number of them are made up of more than one community area. And these were built based on feedback that was given um, through the My Shy My Future meetings from community areas themselves. So uh, the Garfield Park Community Strategy Region, for example, encompasses both the East Garfield Park and the West Garfield Park community areas. And we'll get into a little bit later how to identify which community area you're located in to confirm your eligibility. Um, so in general, just to reiterate, the focus of this RFP is on agencies um, that serve these 15 strategy regions and on the young people and their communities that live within those regions. Additionally, for the programs where agencies will be recruiting youth um, to events and things like that, we do have a number of target populations that all of our programs are focused on. Those are listed here, so we are encouraging uh, respondents to actively recruit from those populations wherever possible. And these can be found in the RFP on pages 
9 and 10, so I won't read through all of them. Um, and then we will get into the program requirements. So this is really a big bulk of our presentation today and of the RFP. Um, this is on RFP pages 10 to 17. We start with sort of more generally the goals of the program and the alignment between the anchor organizations program and the pillars of the My Shy My Future community strategy that Maria mentioned earlier on. So those larger goals for the program are that this work activates and convenes a network of, a caring, of caring adults, that the work strengthens the opportunity ecosystem for Chicago's youth within each of the communities where the work is being done, and that the work connects youth to opportunities centering their voice and their choice. So moving into the actual requirements um, and activities of the program, they are hosting monthly convenings, developing a community plan, developing and hosting community engagement events, hiring a program manager, and ensuring that the agency and its collaborators and youth are connected to the My Shame My Future platform. So we'll dig into each one of these in a bit or a lot more detail. So starting off with hosting monthly convenings. So each of the 15 delegates who are funded for this program will be required to host monthly convenings, actually 10 a year. So there's a little bit of space um, to take a month off for the holidays or something. Um, and these meetings will be hosted within the home community strategy region and are an opportunity for the Inc. organizations to build relationships and collaborate to achieve shared goals. DFSS and um, our partners will be supporting making connections where possible and helping connect anchor organizations with city departments and city sister agencies such as local libraries, parks and schools, but the agencies will really be managing a lot of this outreach. And a key function of these convenings is really bringing folks together to be in the space to, together um, to understand you know, what it is that young people in that specific community need. Um, so the actual sort of work that will be done in order to make these community meetings uh, successful, we can go on to the next slide, um, includes hosting the convenings, which, you know, in, it seems obvious, but there's a lot of work that needs to happen in order for that to be successful. So securing a meeting location, gathering any materials, um, creating space for the participants in these meetings to help develop the um, agendas and develop shared goals, keeping meeting um, minutes and sharing those out, keeping, agen um, keeping the agenda, keeping action items and sort of doing all these things so that the meetings are not one and done, but that they really build upon each other and that we use the outcomes of those meetings to build the community plan and um, strengthen the work that's, that's being done here. Um, sort of mentioned this, but overseeing outreach and attendance. So working with the city, but also doing independent, you know, deep outreach and relationship building within the community to ensure a diverse group of stakeholders are at these meetings. So we are asking that the, the meetings include a range of groups. Um, so young people, faith-based organizations, social influencers, youth serving organizations. These are just some of the examples of the types of folks that we are wanting to be in the room. So anyone who is involved in the work of connecting young people to opportunities. Uh, agencies will be required to send meetings, follow up with attendance, ensuring that stakeholders are coming back to meetings and submitting data about attendees um, to these meetings to DFSS. Um, next, sort of related to those those first tasks, but agencies will be required to gather and report feedback and data. So, you know, a lot of a lot of findings we we are sure will come out of these meetings. So um, gathering what is shared during the meetings, what questions are brought up and what things are discussed, because that'll really help develop the community plan. Um, and likewise, just tracking topics that are identified, themes, meeting notes. And then next is offering trainings and support. So these meetings can be used certainly for convenings, you know, sharing goals, but also these meetings can be used to um, build skills and share resources. So if there are things that are brought up that folks, you know, want to meet with someone who has skills in a certain area or something like that, these meetings can be an opportunity to do that. And also just that these these meetings are supportive spaces and opportunities for folks to share, ch um, share challenges and strategies with one another. So they're a generative space, but also a learning and a collaborating space. All right, so the next step of this process is the creation of the community plan. So the anchor organizations will be um, key 
directly responsible for, but in collaboration with community stakeholders to develop a community plan that will outline a strategy to connect young people to programming in the agency's home region. The community plan is designed to really build upon and enhance the work that's already being done in the community area, understand you know, what assets exist, but also what gaps there are and what work can be done in order to close those gaps and provide the services and opportunities that young people need to thrive. Um, the plan specifically will, as Maria mentioned, since this is ARP funded, address the ways that um, pandemic harm has disproportionately impacted the community and what work can be done to um, address those specific needs. Um, and we're going to get into all of the details of what the community plan looks like um, and what the process will be towards building it. But this is a really specific and important piece of the process. So definitely encourage you to um, yeah, look through the look through the RFP and review all this material because there's a lot there and it's really um, each piece of it is critical to achieving the work. So this is a timeline that gives an overview of all of the pieces and sort of goals of the community planning process and also the duration and schedule at which those will happen. So the first step of the community plan is really just getting folks together in the room, identifying shared goals and finding individuals and organizations who might be interested in really sitting down and doing some of the work along with the anchor organization to get the community plan built. The next uh, critical piece of the community plan process is conducting a community needs assessment. So again, doing that work of understanding what does our community have and what gaps are there that we might be able to fill. And then there will be basically a sort of process of drafting the community plan, getting feedback, updating, implementing it, actually putting it out there, sharing it for you know, schools, agencies, caring adults, folks to use it and really do the work um, that's been outlined in the community plan and then an opportunity to evaluate. Um, and importantly, there's also, you, you can see in here at a couple points, an opportunity for doing some work around sustainability and really thinking about how is this plan going to um, continue to develop and build after the uh, contract period has concluded. So we hope that this isn't something, again, that sort of is built only to function during a really specific period of time, but it's something that can continue to grow and continue to serve the community for years to come. Um, so the work that will be required in order to create the community plan is um, organizing and overseeing working groups. So like I said, establishing individuals, both young people and agency representatives or caring adults from the community to actually be a part of working groups where the community plan research and development will be done. Um, the agency will be required to host working group meetings where this work can happen um, and also will be responsible for you know establishing check-ins to make sure that the work that gets started or discussed in the working groups is moving forward. Um, there's also in the budget funding to offer stipends to participants in the working group since this is more of a time commitment than attending a monthly meeting. So the agency will be required to coordinate getting that compensation to organizations and youth. Um, we discussed this by conducting the community needs assessment. So this is a required piece of the community plan, doing that research, understanding um, both using, you know, worked on the ground talking to people, doing surveys, also data that we're able to support through the My Shy My Future app, through other city databases, um, and understanding what is this, what does this community really have that's amazing and we want to build on and what gaps are there that need to be filled. Um, and then completing and implementing the plan according to the timeline that we just showed. So there may be some things that happen on a slightly different time frame. There will be certainly things that happen within each of those um, periods of time, but we want to ensure that everyone is working towards their community plan at a similar pace and meeting those goals. Um, so just outlining specifically what are the components that are required to be included in this community plan. So there's, you know, background, the opportunity and needs assessment, a plan to do this work and to build upon the work, an outline of the stakeholders that exist within the community and their roles and responsibilities, the commitment to My Shy My Future. So there should always be a connection between this work since it was built out of the My Shy My Future initiative um, back to the pillars of the community um, 
initiative and then a plan to coordinate for outreach education and engagement strategies to link folks to this community plan so it doesn't just sit there and then finally implementing it so this is a real you know document whether it's physical or published online or ideally both um, and there needs to be a plan to get that out um, host events if needed to get this in front of people monitor how it's being used tracking goals and then again touched on this briefly but evaluating the community plan is really critical here so we don't want to just put this out there assume it's working and leave it there is time built in to gather feedback from community stakeholders both in the implementation plan in in the implementation and development of the plan but also throughout the time that it's out in the world um, and to make updates as needed and then lastly drafting the sustainability scope so really thinking about what are the elements that can be sustained without funding, what other funding sources might there be to help continue or implement this work, um, and this, should, this will actually be a part of the community plan once it's complete. Um, all right, so another component of this program is developing and hosting community engagement events. So there is an opportunity for anchor organizations to host some events that really are starting to fill some of the gaps or the needs identified through the community plan. Um, these, po these programs should be hosted within the home community strategy region um, and some examples of what these could look like are out of school time opportunity fairs for youth, job recruitment events, um, job readiness trainings, and these can be youth based or they can be more broadly for the community. So it's sort of once there's been some work done identifying what are some of the trainings or resources or opportunities that folks in our community need these events will be opportunities to really provide those direct services and um, make stuff happen in a more immediate sense. So we have these happening at, th there are three um, events per year. We have these aligned with sort of key out of school time periods for young people throughout the year. So an event happening right around spring, CPS spring break, an event happening right at the beginning of summer, maybe an opportunity for job recruitment and out of school time opportunities, and then a program happening um, at the start of the school year, whether that's again, connecting youth to after school time opportunities or a celebration or um, other event that sort of kicks off the school year. For these community engagement events, again, these are, um, events that are intended to be for around 100 participants from the community. So just work developing um, a quality program that's responsive to the, the gaps identified in the community plan, overseeing all of the event logistics, managing outreach, making sure that folks are attending these events and hosting any planning meetings and follow-up communications and things that are required for the program. Um, so, the this program will also um it's a lot of work as we've we've already discussed um but this is there is funding built into this program to hire or reassign an existing staff member to be a program manager for this work so this is a full-time position um that will be assigned to really supervise and implement the community anchor organizations program so again, this can be someone who is a newly hired or reassigned position, and they will be responsible for basically all of the previous program requirements that I've mentioned, certainly working with other staff and leadership at the anchor organization, but really making sure that they're the person that gets, you know, gets it done and gets the word out about meetings and is there hosting the working groups, um, getting the community plan created, printed out in the world and all of these things. They will also be the point of contact um, with DFSS, so they'll be responsible for making sure that the data requirements and things like that are fulfilled. Um, and this is someone who really ideally would be from the community, um, but certainly someone that has knowledge of and experience and relationships in the anchor organization's home community and that has skills in community organizing, but also project management um, and leadership. So this is um, the functions of hiring this person essentially are to hire them and oversee them, um, administering payroll for the program manager, and then this program manager will be, as we've mentioned, there are youth components to the program, so the, um, the staff person must have all of the proper training and background clearances um, that we require of all staff or volunteers working with young people through DFSS program, so a background check, mandated reporter training, and CPR 
and first aid certification. Um, and then again, it's, I talked about some of these, but getting a little bit deeper into the program manager's roles and responsibilities. So they are really working with leadership to administer the program, you know, the face of these meetings and convenings, hosting them, being there, checking folks in, doing all of that stuff. Um, they're, you know, the person behind the community engagement event. So making sure that outreach is happening, that vendors are paid, um, that folks are coming and things like that. Um, and then they are sort of overseeing and ensuring that the community plan is being developed according to the timeline, also playing a role certainly in the actual development of the community plan. Um, some of this work may be done by different folks on the team or outside consultants, but they're, they're um, certainly gonna also play a role in the development, whether that includes writing or gathering um, materials for the plan and then overseeing implementation of it and managing the connection to the uh, My Share My Future platform. And then as I mentioned, asking is that acting as that liaison between DFSS, the mayor's office, and other um, anchor organizations around the city as needed. So the last program requirement is ensuring that the agency, as well as any collaborating organizations, so that would be working group um, members and those attendees coming to the monthly convenings, as well as youth are connected to the My Share My Future platform and app. So the My Shy My Future platform, as many of you I hope know, is a, you know, an amazing resource for young people and for their communities and families to find out what things are happening in their city and, well, and specifically in their neighborhoods and in their communities. So we wanna make sure that we are supporting that by um, using all of the information that the anchor organizations build through the community planning and community convening process um, and getting that getting all the resources and things that are identified through that process onto the app just to make sure that more young people are connected to more opportunities. So really the um, functions of that are doing outreach, making sure that folks know about the My Share My Future app, know how to use it and things like that. But also importantly, um, a really exciting opportunity for the Anchor Organizations program is that the um, Anchor orgs will be managing community pages, which are a new feature or sort of a redesigned feature on the My Shine My Future website, which is going to be a home base essentially for each of the 15 um, community anchor organizations, community uh, or the anchor organization communities where they can do things like share the community plan, share notifications about these monthly convenings, but also um, a home base for all of the information about things happening that are relevant to youth within their home community. So that's a really exciting new piece um, that these delegates will get to work on. All right, I'm gonna pass it back over to Maria. I think you've heard enough from me for a while to talk through the specifics of the budget and a few other details. Yes, thank you so much, Tess. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this information is in the RFP. Um, I do want to take a quick sidebar um, pause to mention that this is this work that we are um, uh, organizing here with the Community Anchor Org work is a little bit different from what we've put out at least through the enrichment portfolio. Some of you have are some of our agencies that do the programming work in the school year program model or the year round or have done summer. Um, even with the safe spaces, that was a little bit different in terms of the youth employment because we do have a youth employment um, portfolio. So I, I wanna make sure that everyone is taking the opportunity to reflect. It is a uh, wonderful opportunity for some agencies, but this may not be a fit for everyone. Um, as Tess went through some of the requirements and some of the things that we're tracking in terms of our outputs and outcomes, this is a unique stream of work that requires there to be, uh, from the anchor organization that's leading that home region, it, it, there requires there to be a foundational connection with organizations in the community. Um, and we've had a lot of questions and some uh, even just a few minutes ago about agencies not within the home region that they are applying for. And we wanna emphasize that we, we want to see it be an organization that is within that community strategy region. Um, we don't, 
you know, we, we, we know that there are organizations that are already doing really great work. And I think that's the reason that we keep saying this, this work is going to enhance and provide funding for some of that work that is a lot of times grassroots and, and really feels organic. This is really going to provide um, more funding to do that work to make those connections with the youth programs that are already out there. So I just want to make sure that although, you know, we may, we may, we are putting this out there as an opportunity through the enrichment portfolio and through our department. This stream of work is very specific and has really specific requirements. Um, and we wanna make sure that it's successful. We wanna make sure that agencies are really well positioned and already have roots in the community regions that they are applying for. So I'm, again, we're happy to answer any questions that might come through, but it is, key for an organization to provide a location that is in that community strategy region. So in terms of the budget, um, more information is on page seven, pages 17 and 18. Um, when the application comes through, there will be just really an acknowledgement that the budget is something that you agree with. Uh, as you can see here, there are very specific line items for what we're looking for. Um, and once the once agencies are selected, you know, agencies will receive a list of allowable expenses within each of these categories, but it is pretty straightforward. Um, every every community strategy area will receive the exact same amount of funding. So you can see here some of the things that Tess mentioned in terms of the requirements, the, you know, space rental, um, in terms of the community plan, doing research or um, outreach materials, in terms of the working groups, the community organization on our area. So there is some funding for that and then youth honor area because we want to ensure that youth voice is incorporated in here. Um, so again, this is just really great information for you to know what it is that this entails um, and you know, how it's connected to the funding that we're provided. So there is detail here that you can see for a total of $250,298 per year. Um, this there is an opportunity, so typically our contracts are reimbursement only. There is an opportunity for an advance payment policy with this funding, with this specific funding. Um, in the application, respondents will indicate whether they wish to utilize this opportunity for the advance payment policy option. And when applicants are selected, then they can submit the form um, to receive that funding in advance. But for now, you your agency just needs to tell us whether or not you want to exercise this option. All right, so I am going to get a little bit into goals and outcomes on a high level. Tess mentioned pretty much every single one of these things as she was talking through the program requirements, so I don't want to get into too much detail because you can see it's outlined here and it's outlined in the RFP. But I, I do wanna reiterate that this really brings me again to that point of this information is, is information we are going to be tracking from every agency, every delegate agency that is selected. So in terms of community convenings, you see, you see here the outputs and outcomes. Um, this is information that you know, DFSS is gonna coordinate in terms of data collection. So there will be ways to report this back to us that we'll get into once we select the delegate agencies. So just in terms of questions that we may anticipate about how do we send this back to you or how do we know, that is information that we are going to share out once we select delegate agencies. Um, more than likely, if you all are familiar with us, we do use CitySpan as a system to collect data. So that's most likely what's going to happen, um, but there will be a way, a system, a data system to collect this information. Um, as you can see here, we have outputs and outcomes specific to the community plan in terms of folks who are attending the working group meetings or the deadlines, uh, or meeting the, the deadlines, um, attending or completing the activities that are outlined in the community plan, things like that. Um, and then also with uh, community engagement events, you can see that here. We did get a question earlier about if the working groups were different from the monthly convenings, and you can see they are different because they do have specific out outputs and outcomes as well. Um, and then in, in the work that Tess was mentioning around the My Shine My Future platform, we will be tracking that as well. We wanna ensure that agencies that are working with us are helping us really push that work along and ensuring that the opportunities are on the website and the app. 
And so this this is in direct reference to what I was mentioning earlier about having a physical location for an agency to have a physical location in the regions. If you are not familiar, these are the regions that, oh, Tess also highlighted them earlier, but these are the regions where we are looking for community organizations um, to apply. So you can see that here. Respondents must submit one application for each region. So if agencies are interested in serving multiple regions, you just have to, you're allowed to do that, but you do have to submit one, a separate application for each of the regions. Um, and that uh, point that I've made multiple times is bolded here where there must be a physical address on the application for the region that you wish to apply. Um, it, there have been some questions around, are we within that region? How do we know? This website will take you to this page here on the Chicago Data Portal. Um, and the, we wanted to highlight this because there is a little symbol on the upper left-hand corner where you can click on that and an address bar will pop up. And so you can just type the, type the address of the physical location that you're wanting to see if it's in that community area um, and that will pop up. So wanted to bring that up as well. So now I'll pass it back to Tess to talk about selection criteria, but if any questions are coming up, please feel free to add them to the question box because that's something that I will be monitoring um, for the next few minutes. And I see a lot of questions, so I'll get to answering them and then I'll have um, Tess share the selection criteria. Thank you. So yeah, so these are the criteria that we, um, our reviewers will be reviewing your responses and applications to our uh, Tess, could you move closer to your microphone, please? Oh. I'm sorry, I moved it up. Um, thank you. Um, so these are the criteria in five categories that applications will be um, reviewed against, and these are outlined in the RFP on pages 23 and 24. So the first category is community involvement. So we'll be looking, does the respondent understand the distinct assets and challenges faced by the region it serves? Um, does the respondent have expertise in working with the target population and have the relevant capabilities or infrastructure needed to serve this group? And um, does the respondent's organization reflect and engage the diverse people of the communities it serves? The next category is organizational capacity. So in this category, we'll be looking that the respondent has a plan to ensure a qualified staff person is responsible for program oversight and management. Um, that the respondent has adequate systems and processes to support monitoring program expenditures and fiscal controls, and that the respondent has articulated a strategy to ensure um, adequate staffing beyond the program manager to achieve the outcomes of the program. The next category is strength of the proposed program. So does the respondent provide a clear connection between their organizational mission or their mission for this program and the vision and mission of My Shy My Future, which again are in the RFP and can be found at the My Shy My Future website? Um, does the respondent provide a clear connection between their proposed program activities and the outcome goals listed in the RFP? Um, does the respondent have a plan to recruit and retain collaborating agencies in the region? That would be to be part of the community convenings and working groups, um, that the respondent has experienced partnering with other local organizations to better support the community that it serves, that the respondent demonstrates prior experience with planning, promoting, and executing events, Just thinking about those community engagement events, and that the respondent demonstrates an understanding of resources or processes available to use in determining the assets and gaps in the um, community strategy region. The next category is performance, performance management and outcomes, so thinking about uh, data. The respondent demonstrates evidence of strong past performance in similar programs against desired outcome goals and performance metrics. So this is a new program, but in any similar work, what have outcomes um, and goals looked like? The respondent has prior experience using data to inform or improve its services or practices. The respondent has the relevant systems and processes needed to collect and store key participant and performance data. Um, the respondent has the relevant systems and processes needed to track and report performance on program outcomes, and that the respondent has demonstrated experience with collecting and analyzing data to inform programming. 
and then looking at reasonable costs, budget justification, and leverage of funds. So the respondent describes the cash flow and capacity to expend funds prior to implementing the proposed program or has selected the city's cash advanced policy. Um, the respondent demonstrates an understanding of how the allotted budget can be implemented to meet the proposed scope of the work or work plan. And again, this there's a set budget amount for this program, so it's not a budget proposing um, different amounts, but really understanding and sharing with us how, how you see um, the set budget amount being leveraged to implement the program. And the respondent describes an auditing process. A um, couple of things to note, one is that a program, a requirement of the application is that you attach a job description for this program manager position. And again, those sort of requirements of that role and the outline of what that role should look like is in the RFP. Um, and then just to reiterate that the there is a budget requirement. Um, it should ensure that all of the program requirements are covered. So there should be funding put towards each of the requirements listed in the RFP. And then again, it should not exceed that total outlined in the sample budget provided uh, in the RFP and table four. All right, just reiterating a few of these key deadlines, the proposal pre-proposal webinar that we're having right now. Um, applications are due on Friday, February 2023, February 3rd, 2023 at 12 o'clock noon which is redundant, but worth saying twice because that is a very strict deadline. Um, and we encourage you to submit as far ahead of that as is possible, but knowing that that deadline is strict and you definitely need to have your applications in by then. The program period will begin in March, 2023. And then I think we have one more slide reiterating the application deadline. So I'll just let you read that in red and pass it over to Julia to go through all of the details, important details of navigating the e-procurement system. Thank you. I'm going to take a little break here just sort of to summarize, uh, look at some of the questions that we've been at, that have been asking, uh, been asked and answered, um, that just for, for those following along at home. Uh, so I think some of the, the great Questions would be, um, are the monthly convening, convenings different or distinct from the community plan working group meetings? Uh, so they would be, yes. Uh, feel, free to, feel free to chime in, uh, Tess or Maria, on these. Um, so yes, they are. The working group meetings are specifically about developing and implementing a community plan at the beginning, and the community plan will be the guide to the monthly convenings once it's completed. Um, there's a couple of questions about, you know, you're not organ you're not located in one of the 15 regions, but you serve the community through your, those communities through the existing services. Would you still be able to apply? Um, and then I think that could we go through that answer again, Maria or Tess? Sorry, could you say the question again? Uh, the question here is about just to, it's about my organization's office is not located in any of the Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, just service. reiterating what. Pardon? Yeah, the question about that I had responded to about the location. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. kind of reiterate yep, that. Just, yeah, just reiterating what Maria said in the presentation that um, the work is, those community regions, as we mentioned, were were identified for very specific reasons. And it is, we wanna make sure that the agencies that are being served as well as the beneficiaries that, the beneficiaries that they are serving are you know, truly located within those regions. So that's why we do have the address requirement that the agency must be located there. And we have you know, other opportunities through DFSS for other programs that have different geographical requirements. So if this one isn't a fit for you, there may be something else that applies to you based on your location. Couple of questions about um, if uh, if your organization has applied to other funding opportunities, specifically the My Shine My Future year-round safe spaces, but doesn't know. Um, those decisions are being made in the next few weeks, um, and then notifications will be sent out. Um, in terms of, there was another question here about collaboration. Julia, yes, can I just chime in that agencies? both that are getting funded and that are not getting funded will receive notification. So at pretty close 
timing of that just to ensure that we, we do understand that agencies may be interested in this opportunity as well. So wanting to make sure everyone knows that whether or not you get funded, you will receive notification. Right. Thank you. And then here was a question about collaboration. Um, so you want to give a little guidance about people who might want to collect um, to who work in collaboration, how that might happen. Um, there's, you could add your contact information to the chat box if anybody wants to reach out. Um, those were some questions. And then here are some unanswered questions. So for the program manager, do you recommend that this comprises that individual's entire work stream or do you see it as, a, as it feasible to be one, to this would be one major project within a pro program program manager's larger workload? This should be one role. Yeah. And that's outlined in the RFP, but we'll share that response. And does South Shore cover Bronzeville's 3600 South Roads? If that would be something that would be a great opportunity for you to use the, the link to the map. Where you, I uh, where you click on the, I thought it was we were clicking on Rock Rockford, but it, I then saw the icon. And that link, that website is linked in the RFP, so you can find that. And if you have any issue for any reason, let us know. But that website, um, which is in this presentation, is also linked in the RFP, so you can just just remember to look for this thing that's like a little X with the arrow, <laughs> and that will set you up. Although it kind of looks like a campfire, so I. I'm glad that I uh, that was I would not succeed in probably operating that. Uh, this will the slide deck be shared with attendees? The slide deck and the this webinar, which is being recorded, will be posted on the DFSS website. Please give us about five business days to do that. Um, the, we post everything. We will post the the webinar in its entirety onto the DFSS YouTube channel, and then we will also. Put a link to that and then a power the, the PDF of the slides onto the website underneath the funding opportunity asso page associated with this RFP. Um, so it says, I think the lingering question is till about boundaries. Is it specific to the 19 CCVI or the 15 communities? Yeah. I was just responding to this. I'll just yeah reiterate that it it's so it's 19 Chicago community areas which are which make up 15 community strategy regions. Um, the map that we link to that we were just discussing will tell you which community area you're located in. So um, there isn't a map like that that outlines the my shine my future community strategy region. So you'll want to identify if you're in one of the 19 community areas, and then you can see which one of the strategy regions that community area falls within. Mentioned showing cash flow, you also mentioned advanced payment eligibility. How do you determine if you are eligible to qualify for advanced payments? Um, I believe everybody is actually eligible to qualify for advanced payments. Last time I checked, the payments were capped at 25, 20 or 25% of the total grant amount, which in this case is fixed. Um, do understand that advanced payment doesn't mean you're going to get more money. It just means you get the money up front. If, if, if it's sort of front loaded, it's not that you get more. So you would have to, you know, budget accordingly. <laughs> um, will we receive notification of award before March 1st, or is March 1st just the earliest we can allow allocate budget expenses? And the answer to that is we hope to send award notifications before March 1st, but certainly by March 1st, and that will be the earliest agencies can allocate expenses. Um, there was a question here more about if the east side or south gearing is part of greater Roseland, and that's gonna be basically, please refer back to the map. Um, that, uh, that seems to be the questions that we have now. I'm now gonna go through how do you actually make an application in the city of Chicago's e-procurement system. This is the only way you can make, it, make an application, um, which I had to write to somebody this morning when they sent me like a PDF about what I assumed was an application or some sort of virus. Um, but we don't, we don't open things, we generally don't open files from 
unsolicited organizations. The only way we can grant you a contract is if you go through the e-procurement system. And so I'm going to teach, talk, talk about a little bit the mechanics of making this app, going through the application process and how to do that. We're going to go, I'll show you slides of the two kind of most common things you're going to have to do in this system. And then we can open it back up for questions. So I've been doing this role for quite a while and I look at hundreds of applications and I do tens of, you know, at this point I've done hundreds of RFPs and these are some of my tips, which is uh, on how to be successful or at least set yourself up for success in the city of Chicago's e-procurement application experience. Um, it, I wish I could make it sound like a ride on Great America. I think it feels like a ride at Great America, probably one of those ones we drop a lot suddenly. Um, but but uh, I here are some tips that maybe it can be something more soothing and relaxing. Um, it's probably never gonna be like a spa day, but you can at least make it a little less terrifying. So my biggest point of advice, gratuitous or not, is to give yourself enough time to set yourself up to success to do a good job. Um, I think as Maria and Tess have alluded, these are the, our RFPs are dense documents. They contain a lot of information and a lot of direction. Um, which is both good and bad, give yourself time to kind of figure out how your organization is going to fit, or to, you know, fit in with this program, if it's a good fit or not. That's kind of the hardest, sometimes the hardest decision because we all hate to say no to money, right? Even, and, um, but, but really, truly make sure that this is something that you guys can sync with. It's in line with your mission. It's supported by your boards, et cetera because that's how you set yourself up for the success in the more longer term, right? Uh, if you've never done business with the city of Chicago, you need to register into the iSupplier e-procurement system as soon as possible. You're gonna register for an iSupplier account and that will allow you to access e-procurement, which is where all of the city of Chicago's RFPs are accessed. Um, getting into iSupplier takes sometimes up, up to a few days a lot of things that communications that come from iSupplier or e-procurement are going to end up in your spam. So make sure that you check spam if you need to. And then also do not, if you already have an iSupplier account, please, please, please do not set up a new one. Just all you need is one. All you need is one. If you have problems accessing your iSupplier account, if the person who is like the, you know, the, the captain of your iSupplier account has left and not for giving anybody any passwords, et cetera, please call the hotline. You can kind of help tease those things out, but do understand that this is a, an account like every other account that you have set up on everybody, every other website for the most part in that it is yours and yours to maintain. We actually don't have a lot of control or access. We can give you guidance, but we don't have a master key to like to, to reset or undo um, access issues around access for the most part. It's, it, you know, so if this is your problem, please start early because it sometimes takes a minute to kind of unravel and figure out how to, how to get you back in or how to get you the, the permissions that you need within your organization's iSupplier account. As um, has been sort of said as a theme to this RFP webinar, review the RFP narratives and applications questions closely. Remember that they align with the scope and selection criteria and use the information in the RFP for guidance in formulating your answers. We don't sort of build these things randomly. The RFP narratives are scrutinized and from them come application questions and come selection criteria, which you can see the weights of. And from both of those things, we develop our evaluation tools and score your application accordingly. So the best opportunity, the best way for you to write a successful RFP or successful application for us is to really come to the webinar, listen, ask questions, but look at those RFP narratives, that scope, look at the details, you know, email or call us. We are available. My and Maria's numbers are at the end of this presentation. They're easy enough to find um, if you just Google our names at this point and, and you know, engage. It's very hard, you know, it's hard to engage. We're all very busy and this is not always, you know, our, our programs are often, you know, they're meaty and so they're kind of hard to engage with sometimes, but it's really worth it if you want to do a good job. 
Um, there's a 4,000 character limit, which includes punctuation and spaces for each response. So each response is allocated 4,000 characters, not just one. 4,000 characters is about two thirds of a single space page. And then finally, when you are working in the e-procurement environment, do not use the back button on your browser because e-procurement will not it, navigate other ways. And I can show, I'll show you a little bit of how to do that in some later slides, but don't use the back button. E-procurement will pretend it's working, but it will really stop saving it. At some point it will kick you out with an error message. And when you go back in, nothing that you have done since you used that back button is not, is going to, um, is going to register. So that's uh, that. And then my mantra always is start early and save often because that's what you, you want to do. But really, start early. Um, you can submit your application and later amend it up until the due date, which is February 3rd at 12 noon. Um, we will go through slides about how to do the submission, but I say avoid the rush and possible mishaps by submitting early. I love it when people submit a day early because then you can do it on your terms. Plan on your submission and taking 30 to 60 minutes, if you, especially if you haven't done this before. And understand that, like, don't do this last minute. There are a number of people always doing this last minute. If you call us last minute, we are much more likely to be on the phone with somebody else and maybe aren't going to be able to take your call or are not going to be able to give you the kind of in-depth, problem-solving, deep answer that you might need. So... I really suggest that people call, you know, like there's a finite number of people who work on the helpline. There's a finite number of people within the organization, within DFSS, who are going to be able to give you the kind of guidance that you need if it's something more than just a very sort of yes, no, or cursory problem. And so set yourself up for success and make sure and, and try to get this in early. Um, I recommend putting it in a day early because then you can feel superior and relaxed about it. Um, but even a couple of hours makes all the difference in the world. Almost, not every time, but I certainly have sat, that there is at least a few times a year when somebody is on the phone with me and what they, the problems that they're experiencing in, in, in e-procurement are not fixable in the 10 or five minutes they have given me to fix it. And literally you just, I just sit on the phone with them while we watch all of their hard work not be submitted. And it's very, very sad for us all. Um, this system does not allow us to accept late applications unless we re-release the entire RFP, which means everybody who did apply on time would have to reapply. And so don't, don't do that. Just get it in on time. You can submit your application and later amend it up until the due date. So if you are a new person to the e-procurement system, we're gonna, you, you can submit it, you can practice submitting it, and then you can pull it back and amend it and add whatever you need and then submit it again. Um, you should make use of myself and the e-procurement hotline for help, and that's 312-744-4357 or 744-HELP. Uh, you can also email them, and the email is on the next, um, I think, my next slide. Uh, I try to return all of my phone calls within 24 hours. The e-procurement hotline, generally, if you don't get them, leave them a message. They will call you back within 24 or 48 hours. Please note that the hotline operates during business hours only, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And I tend to operate less uh, standard business hours. I'm, I'm always here 9 to 5, but if you call me before or after work, I may, if I'm in the office, I pick up the phone. If my phone is forwarding to my cell phone, I'll tend to answer the phone as well because I want you guys to, I want you guys to, to have your work appreciated. I want you to have as positive an experience in submission, submitting as possible. Um, if you are interested in more opportunities for you know for to apply to, you should go to the DFSS website and look at, under the alerts section, or you can also look under funding opportunities, and you can also look under just the um, that's where the RFPs are going to be posted. You can also just you know go to the to the subject matter the subject group that you are interested in and see what they're up to. Um, if you have questions about how to get how to start your iSupplier account. You really want to go to customer support or again call that helpline or if you have questions of technical questions and if you finally if you are a person who really hates talking to other people um, and learns best by just videos youtube video kind of stuff and powerpoint slides there are a lot of training materials at this link and i highly suggest that you 
avail yourself of them. There's just, a, you know, look under, there's a couple of different sections in that. Look under the delegate agency section. That's That will be the most relevant to your experience with our RFPs. Um, with that said, we're going to go into two different things that you're going to have to do as part of the RFP uh, application experience in, with DFSS in the city of Chicago. One is how to accept an amendment. We do an amendment to post any changes we need to make or corrections we need to make to the RFP itself. But most often what we're really doing is we're just providing the questions and answers to the webinar that we have, uh, that we're doing right now. So in this case, I'm gonna just show you the slides on how to accept an, an amendment. Uh, it will go actually go much quicker in real life when you do this. But in this case, it's gonna be the RFP you are interested in has been amended. In order to start an application, you will need to acknowledge and accept the amendment first. And this will be when you go to start the application, if the amendment has happened, it will basically, you'll get this warning. You can click on the a view amendment history to start the amendment, the accepting of the amendment process. If the amendment hadn't been addressed, hadn't been amended yet, you can just go to this create quote bar of, of action, you know, pull it down, hit create quote, and then click on go on the right hand side. And that's how you would actually start an application if it had not been amended. Because there is an amendment, you're going to need to accept the amendment before it will let you go forward and start the application. So you're going to hit the view amendment history, which will take you to this screen. And this is where you can actually do all sorts of things. You can review the changes. You'll see here in this little middle part, there's an amendment description, which is just a one sentence that we do about how do we do, um, you know, about the amendment what the amendment contains. Uh, if you click on this document number here, which is, you know, I'm kind of going backwards with the number one, that's gonna take you to, uh, that's gonna take you, I think, to the actual, the RFP itself. And then if you wanna review the changes, that's gonna take you to the amendment document. When you are done with all of that, you're going to acknowledge the amendment. And once you acknowledge the, the amendment on the upper right, uh, lower right hand side. It will take you to this screen where you accept uh, you accept the terms and conditions. It's the continue to acknowledge. So you're going to put this. You're going to check the little box on the left. And you're going to hit acknowledge on the right, which will then take you to the confirmation of your acknowledgement, where you're then going to say yes. Uh, if you say no, it will just throw you back to the screen that you just left. Um, so you don't really have a choice. You're going to hit yes. Then you're going to accept the terms and conditions after you check the little box on the bottom of the right left hand side. Basically, the city of Chicago, really the city of Chicago's legal team, wants to make sure that you understand that by accepting the amendment, you are responsible for the for the changes or for the information that we put into that amendment. This is particularly critical if we say change the due date of the amendment. We want you to you know we want you to know. By accepting the amendment, you're saying, yes, I understand you changed the due date. And I'm going to now act accordingly. And if you did not read it for whatever reason, you can't come back and be like, it wasn't fair because blah, 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 blah. No, you have accepted the terms and conditions. You have accepted the responsibility for the, for, you know, that you know the information that was in the amendment. So after you accept for this final time, you're done. So that's your, accept that's, that's your five steps on how to accept an amendment. And now this is how you're going to submit an application. Uh, submitting an application is, you'll see why it could take 30 to 60 minutes. Um, when you're ready to, ready to submit, you're gonna save your draft one last time and then you're gonna click continue. And when you click continue, the e-procurement system is basically gonna take like a little scan of your complete application. And it's gonna tell you where it thinks that you might, where you might have left, um, you might have left off or you might have forgotten to include information. It is not com uncommon, it is, it is common to have to get a number of error messages and we're gonna go over the, the two most common ones. The first is this quote on all lines. This is, you can see right below, there's this little lines tab. In the e-procurement environment, it's a one size fits all e -pro you know, procurement um, data platform or you know application platform and so the lines is not something that DFSS uses you fill out a budget and that is what we do that is what we review that is what we base our assessments on 
lines, however, is where the budget ultimately would end up being under different kinds of procurement. So when you get this error message, we want you to click on the lines and then just put in placeholder numbers or whatever. I keep encouraging people to put in winning lottery numbers, but nobody has taken me up on that yet. Uh, but you, know, you guys could be the first. Um, and so once you fill out those placeholder numbers, that error message will go away. The second error message people really get is this quote value is required for requirement first name. In e-procurement speak, the quote value, as you can see, is sort of, it's that 4,000 character limited box where you would put in your application, your the answer to your application question. So that's your quote value. Requirements is an e-procurement speak basically for application question. And the specific question is called first name in this case, which is you know, straightforward enough. So we're basically, when you say a quote value is required for requirement first name, the e-procurement system is saying you forgot to put first, your first name into the box, please do so, and then that error message will go away as well. So once you are free of error messages, when you click the continue section, it will put your error application into this review and submit phase, at which point you are going to review and ultimately submit. So you're basically going to scroll, you can scroll all the way down and you can see all your different answers and review them one last time um, in this tiny font. And at the very bottom of the scrolling, you will see this electronic signature box. You're going to put in your name and your title first, and then you're going to click this little button or uh, this little box above it. If you don't, you'll get an error message telling you to not click the box before you fill out your name and title. And then I have to break this up into two slides, but if you go, if you scroll or pull over to the right-hand side, there will be this little button that says submit, and you will hit submit, and then you will get a confirmation screen. Um, the e-procurement system will send a confirmation email within 24 hours of your submission. If you, and a lot of times, as I said, might end up in your spam or your junk mail, so, so uh, look out for that. Also, please call or email me if you want to know before 24 hours that I got your, you got your thing. I can see the submission literally seconds after you hit submit, and I'm more than happy to verify or confirm via phone or email that I just, that you received your application, um, if that makes you feel more comfortable. So that really concludes what I have to say about the glorious e-procurement experience and how to make an application in the, um, in this environment, this platform. I'm going to turn it back over. I see there's been a lot of questions that that Maria and Tess have been answering, and so I'm going to actually turn it back over to them to maybe go through some highlights if they want of the questions asked, and then there'll be a little, you know, we still have time for some more questions. Here is the uh, a programmatic and the contact information for myself and for Maria. If you call or email me about questions, about the program, I'm going to refer you to Maria because I don't want to tell you something wrong. Uh, if she did, oh, she might, she probably would do the same about e procurement because we want, who would want to answer an e procurement question if they didn't? Um, so just try to, you know, if she doesn't answer, I will, you know, I can email, I can forward an email or, or, or note, that you call, note that you called to her, but it, I'm not going to answer your program as tempting as it is. Uh, so thank you Thanks, so much Julia. for your time. <laughs> um, just a quick note for all who have specific questions about your um, meeting the criteria or your agency work. Um, my email is probably the quickest way to get a hold of me. Um, I can always seek support if I need to, if I can't answer right away. So that is definitely the best way of getting a hold of me. You can uh, leave me a voicemail and send an email. That would be easiest. I think Julia may have noted this, but a lot of the questions that come up now and that will come up um, in the next couple of days, we're, we are going to publish in an amendment so that you'll have that information. And it's always best to have the documentation of the questions that come through. Um, for the benefit of all, but just also so that you have something to refer back to should you have any follow-up questions. 
and that should actually be a period between Maria and Guzman. I will put it in the, in the chat, but it, that is um, a dash now, but it should be a period. So in, in while I was chatting about about uh, the e-procurement system, what, what I saw there were so many questions coming in, if perhaps you, if there was any highlights that we, or we should reiterate, um, please, please go forward with that. Um, sure. Um, I think folks had questions in terms of meeting the requirement or not, or anticipating having some challenges in meeting some of the numbers. And certainly, you know, we we understand that there will be challenges. This is, like I said, in some community areas work that folks have already been doing. Um, and this will enhance some of that work. Um, but agencies that are familiar with organizations and the work that is already out there will certainly know how to reach out to others or how to gather folks. So all of the requirements in terms of the data that we're tracking and what we're asking and help holding agencies accountable for is outlined in the RFP. And if you anticipate having some of those challenges um, and still want to apply, I encourage you to not just write that in the application, but also how you plan on addressing some of those challenges if those are things that you are already aware of. Um, I think that's mostly what, what the questions were about. Um, there was one specific question, a question about overlapping um, stakeholders who may overlap geographical service areas. And although that may be true because there is some, um, some bordering communities that are pretty close to each other. Every physical address in Chicago is tied to a specific community area. So, you know, encourage applicants to look at the website and ensure that they know exactly what community area that physical address is, and then applying for that region. So I see there's, anything one, that you see? there's one last question here, which was, does the RFP, RFP detail the requirements on data collection on the community stakeholders in parentheses, non-city. Yes. <laughs> yes, and that's something that will also be built out more with the um, funded agencies and their work plans. So it may differ, um, you know, some based on how the work develops, but yes. Um, uh, Sorry, I was going to follow up on one thing that Maria said, but I don't remember, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, I'm sorry if I interrupted you. Um, so yeah, so there. I think we'll. It looks like people have asked a lot of questions. We can stay on for a little bit longer. If there are more questions uh, to be to be asked, uh, I think yeah, there's um, the takeaways I, I've learned from this RFP is really that the, this is a dense program and you really, most of the questions that people are asking really could be, could be answered if you, by examining the RFP document, um, which is, which is really, you know, I love the RFP, so that's where it is for me. Um, on the other hand, I wanted to also take the take a minute to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Uh, my my coworkers who are wonderful and knowledgeable, but also the potential applicant pool. Like, thank you so much for considering this program model, and and for the work that you do for the uh, citizens, but specifically the youth in Chicago. Um, and um, yeah, if there's other questions. Please let us let us know, uh, Maria or Tess. Do you guys have any concluding words that you would like to uh, impart? Just don't hesitate to reach out and let us know if you have any questions or anything specific to your agency that you want to discuss. Um, but we look forward to receiving all of the applications of agencies that feel that this is a good fit for them. Yep, echo that as, and I will again echo, check, use the map, check your location. You may think you're in a community area that according to the borders, whether we agree with them or not, is not the community area that we have outlined. So use the map, um, submit early, and we're excited to see all of your responses. Thank you for being here.
uh, I will reiterate my my catchphrase of save or you know uh, saved often submit early. Starting to think if I ever if I ever get a tattoo, maybe we'll say that. Um, but yes, set yourself up for success. Ask the questions you need to ask, and and yeah, save early, uh, save often, and submit early. Kind of you know, it's a lifestyle for me at this point. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, all of you coming here today. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna give back the time that we allocated for this RFP. And I understand it's a beautiful day out today. I, have been, I am in a windowless office, and so I have not ventured out because I've been doing my work. Um, but if you have the ability to look out the window or go outside even to enjoy what seems to be uh, a rare moment of direct sunlight, I encourage you to do so and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. We look so forward to seeing all the great ideas and, and, and thoughts that you have about this program model and the work that you will be able to do for Chicago. Take care. Thanks, Julia. Okay. Thank you.